If you want to do a retrosynthetic analysis of this molecule, the first thing we'll probably spot is that there's two types of classic ring motif that have some reasonably standard chemistry associated with them. On the right hand side, I have a cyclopropane. To me, the most classic way to disconnect that is some sort of carbene or carbonoid chemistry. On the left hand side, we have a 1,4 cyclohexadiene. But to me, this is strongly associated with the Birch reduction. So this is just a quick video about using metals in synthesis. Now the Birch reduction will convert a benzene ring into this 1,4 cyclohexadiene. But as we notice on the other side of the molecule, we need to keep this other benzene ring intact. Also, trying to do a cyclopropanation using a carbonoid would require disconnection back to an alkene, and we've got to keep these other alkenes on the left-hand side intact. So we can't use either of these disconnections in the first instance. We need to separate this problem into two halves and deal with those reactions separately. Luckily here, there's quite an easy disconnection in the middle on that ester to get us going. We can just use a standard way of making an ester here by reacting this alcohol with the acid chloride in the presence of pyridine. And well, to make the acid chloride itself, that's quite a reactive functional group. And the standard way of making those is from the carboxylic acid. So what I actually need to aim for is this carboxylic acid here. Okay, dealing with that carboxylic acid first, it's possible to do the birch reduction already. We can do it directly on the carboxylic acid. In fact, I think that's quite a smart idea. The disconnection is to do a functional group into conversion to give us the aromatic system. Because if I treat this molecule with sodium in liquid ammonia, also in the presence of a proton source, normally an alcohol like ethanol, we can encourage a transfer of electron directly into that pi system, reducing it to an anion form, which can be protonated. The conditions are quite harsh, but the molecule is not too complicated here. When you dissolve the sodium in the liquid ammonia, the electron becomes dissociated and solvated by the ammonia molecules, something like this as the key reagent. I'm just going to represent this with a radical anion form. That electron gets stabilized by being surrounded by ammonia molecules, which of course have a permanent dipole moment. All the hydrogens are slightly delta plus, and so they'll point at the electron. I mean, all sorts of complexes are going to form here, but on average, I think three is pretty standard to form this solvated electron. Now, this solvated electron is a beautiful dark blue color, not a color you see so often in organic chemistry. You get this color because this is a physical manifestation of a quantum potential well. You set up energy levels as you might study in an undergrad chemistry degree, and setting up the quantized energy levels in that potential well happens to absorb in the visible spectrum. If you increase the concentration of sodium and supply more electrons into this system, you actually end up with a solution that looks like metallic gold. And that's because you're squeezing more and more energy levels into that potential well system. And so they get squashed closer and closer together until you get something closer to a band structure rather than defined energy levels, like you get in metals. Anyhow, this solvated electron is our key reagent. And so the mechanism for the Birch reduction, just in a general sense, on the benzene ring looks something like this. The electron inserts itself into the pi system, perhaps drawing something like these arrows. That will give us this reactive intermediate with seven electrons in a cyclic pi system. That's quite reactive, particularly as there's a full negative charge. And so provided there's some ethanol kicking around, we can just protonate. We can note now that we don't have the cyclic pi system anymore, as it's interrupted with this saturated sp3 carbon. We're de left with this pentadienyl radical. This is susceptible to further reduction. Another electron can come along to make it a six electron pi system. Some quick Huckle calculations will show that the largest coefficient of the highest occupied molecular orbital is on that central carbon. So this is the dominant resonance form, which means now if that relatively unstable anion finds an ethanol molecule again, it will pick up a proton on the opposite position from where the other one was put on, as in a 1-4 relationship between these two protons that are being added. And so we end up with the 1-4 diene that we wanted. This pattern really lends itself to a Birch reduction type disconnection. We have to be careful when there's some other substitution on this benzene. We'll always get protonation in a 1-4 relationship, as in opposite across the ring. But regioselectivity factors come in in the first step to determine where this negative charge in yellow ends up. I guess the easiest way of looking at this is that if you have a substituent that's really good at stabilizing that negative charge directly attached to the ring, putting the negative charge there will be great. So if there's an electron withdrawing group there, like a carboxylic acid, the negative charge will most happily sit next to that carbonyl pi system so it can get increased delocalization. So you tend to see the protonation occurring that allows that intermediate specifically to form. If you have an electron donating group though, the opposite is true. Putting an electron donating group, like a methoxy group, next to that negative charge would be super bad. You'll get a lone pair, lone pair interaction. So the lowest energy intermediate will be something which puts the negative charge not next to those lone pairs, 
and you'll progress forward through the rest of the mechanism based on that one. So this is reasonably predictable, and we can have a look at what we've got in our actual molecule. So we don't have a pi system or a lone pair directly attached, but we have these two alkyl substituents. And what we want to determine is where is it best to put negative charges? And the answer is avoid putting the negative charge next to either of these. A more substituted carbanion is less stable than a less substituted one for the normal hyperconjugative reasons. So having a think about where that electron could go, it would be fine if I added it in these green positions and get the 1,4 protonation that way. It'd be less good if I put it in these red positions in the first step, because both of those will lead to a negative charge on a less stable position. So we'll definitely get the correct regioselectivity for reduction if we just use standard Birch conditions here. So then we're just left with, well, how do I make this molecule? Now, I think there's absolutely loads of ways of doing this. I'll note in passing that actually I'm quite happy to keep that carboxylic acid there because in the Birch reduction, probably one of the first few things that happens is formation of the carboxylate. That essentially protects that carbonyl from any reduction. It also protects it from any potential addition reaction. If we had an ester there instead, we would actually risk converting it into the amide if we swamped it with liquid ammonia. So a common protecting group strategy where you protect the carboxylic acid as an ester while you diddle with the rest of the molecule wouldn't work here. I think we actively need to keep the acid there. So basically, disconnection strategies are going to involve how do we get that carboxylic acid on there? I think there's two different cuts that we could look at. We can think of ways of disconnecting right next to the carboxylic acid, perhaps. We'll just call this disconnection path one. Could take us back to something like this. This is xylyl bromide. This is readily available. Not the nicest thing in the world to handle. It was actually used as a tear gas in the early parts of trench warfare in World War I. So you want, at the very least, to be doing this in a fume hood. Things that we could do with this would be, well, you could react it with a cyanide anion. So let's use potassium cyanide. That will take us to the nitrile. And then we can hydrolyze that nitrile just using aqueous acid. That's using a classic D1 synthon approach. An alternative approach would be to use like an A1 synthon. So maybe making the Grignard reagent from the benzyl bromide and attacking carbon dioxide as an electrophilic carbon source. If I had to pick, I'd probably avoid using the cyanide, I guess. The xylyl bromide itself, if we did have to make it, well, it, that would just be some bromination chemistry. Possible options would include just using orthoxylene as a starting material. Now, this is very readily available directly from petroleum refinement processes. I'm pretty certain it would be quite easy to do a free radical bromination just on one of those methyl groups. If you put in shed tons of bromine, you'll probably get loads of bromines added, but with careful control of concentrations. It will be possible to pick the number of bromines you want to add and then, and then just separate. Just a quick note, we definitely don't want to have a Lewis acid in there in this case. If we had a Lewis acid like iron tribromide, that would encourage bromination on the benzene ring directly by an electrophilic substitution mechanism. That's not what we want here. So you just want to be a little careful. You just have to pick your favorite method for initiating this reaction. A really old school way of making the xylyl bromide would be to use some Blanc chemistry and reacting toluene with formaldehyde in the presence of hydrobromic acid. This type of bromoformylation reaction will give the ortho and para products just by the standard electrophilic substitution mechanism. The toluene is more reactive to adding in the para position on sterics for the normal reasons, but the sterics aren't huge here, and there are two ortho sites. In practice, you're going to end up with loads of the ortho product anyway from this. And all you need to do is let your friendly chemical supplier do the reaction, separate the two isomers, and sell you which one you want. And here we just want the ortho one. This sort of statistical effect is one of the reasons why lots of ortho substituted benzene rings are available from commercial sources, as well as the para ones. They often just get made and separated while trying to make other things. An alternative disconnection approach for the carboxylic acid that we need would be to cut directly at the benzene ring now, we can't easily do friedel crafts alkylations at a primary carbon center, but in terms of disconnection speak, what we've essentially got here is a 1-2 difunctionalized system, the carbonyl carbon being 1-2 to the benzene ring. Classical disconnection strategies suggest we should try and use an epoxide for this. We'll get sent down a route where we need to do a functional group interconversion to do this. We can easily go backwards by oxidizing this alcohol under Jones conditions. They'll be using like chromate in the presence of sulfuric acid. That takes an alcohol to the carboxylic acid directly. And then we can just do the standard disconnection for an epoxide using a Grignard reagent derived from this bromide. So what we would do is one, chuck in some magnesium to make the Grignard reagent. 
to chuck in the epoxide to get the alcohol. As I said before, these ortho substituted benzenes are often just commercially available. If for some reason you had to go back to toluene, you could just do the standard disconnection using bromine in the presence of a Lewis acid to encourage bromination in the ortho and para positions, and then you just separate off the isomer that we need. Moving on, we also need to make the alcohol. That's the one at the top right with cyclopropane. And we can just disconnect the cyclopropane quite easily back to the alkene like this. Just looking at the relative stereochemistry of the hydrogens, we need them to be on the same side in the cyclopropane. So they need to be the same side in the alkene as well. So we're going to need this Z geometry. The reason why we can do this sort of disconnection is that we can use Simmons-Smith conditions. That's where we use zinc metal, sometimes in a mixture of copper as well, in the presence of diiodomethane. When we react diiodomethane with zinc, we'll get an oxidative insertion, as is pretty standard for zinc, just like magnesium. And what we get is a species that could be drawn something like this. On the central carbon, we now have a carbon metal bond, would often act as a nucleophile. But we also have this carbon iodine bond, which would often be an electrophile. So the central carbon atom is both electrophilic and nucleophilic at the same time. In our heads, we can pretend it's got a positive and a negative charge on there at the same time, for example. As a result, this class of compounds is normally referred to as a carbonoid. So not the strict definition of the carbene functional group, but one that behaves like that as a result of some other functional groups. Now, depending on the ratios of reagents, it's also possible for this carbonoid to insert into another diiodomethane to give this species with two carbons in it. Both of these essentially react in the same way with an organic substrate. But if you were looking into the kinetics of this reaction, you'd need to factor this in. Now, the alkene that we need to cyclopropanate comes from this chiral alcohol. For the purposes of this discussion, I'm just going to do a racemic synthesis. But we can use a stereocenter on the alcohol to install the cyclopropane diastereoselectively by internal collation. Essentially, the Simmons-Smith reagent coordinates to the alcohol and then can direct either on the top or the bottom face of the alkene. On a quick glance, this might not look like it will work because there might be too much rotation around this bond highlighted in orange. But in fact, for this particular molecule, there is restricted rotation due to the fact that there's a stereocenter next to a Z double bond. There is one particular conformer that's much lower in energy than the rest around that double bond. And that's where this hydrogen in orange is put coplanar with this methyl group so as to minimize one free allylic strain. This effect is often referred to as the Hauk model. As a result, the two remaining groups will be projected above and below the plane of the paper. And we just need to work out which ones they are. One way we can do this quite quickly is just to look at the original stereocenter and think about this like a little turnstile. I want my hydrogen to end up in the plane, which is where this benzyl group currently is. So rotating the hydrogen into the plane will move the benzyl group into the coming forwards position and the hydroxyl group will be shoved towards the back position. So I now know the benzyl group is here and the hydroxyl group will be behind the plane of the alkene. Now there's two ways that we can look at what happens next. One is we could use the lone pair of an oxygen here to coordinate as a ligand to the zinc on the Simmons-Smith reagent. Or in practice, I'm not massively convinced that slightly acidic proton will survive being in the presence of the organometallic. So it might be more accurate to draw some sort of coordination like this, where the carbonoid directly binds to the substrate. And next, we can just use its carbonoid-like behavior. We can draw an arrow that looks a bit like the alkene attacking the alkyl iodide. And at the same time, as that would leave an empty site on the other carbon, the more nucleophilic-looking bond can clip back in to form the cyclopropane. So these arrows are all happening below the plane. So as a result, the two hydrogens that are on the alkene, just these ones in blue, will end up being pushed up, which is exactly the stereochemistry that we need. Just returning to our retrosynthesis, I'm now pretty happy that this step will work as intended to give us the correct diastereomer of product. And all we need to do now is make the alcohol. Now, as I'm doing a racemic synthesis, I'm just going to keep this simple. If you wanted to do an asymmetric synthesis, you could adopt a retrosynthetic analysis that puts that alcohol in with one configuration at that stereocenter, as in one enantiomer of the alcohol. A quick way you could do that would be to maybe use an asymmetric reduction of a ketone. Something like a CBS reduction might work well here, but there are of course many other types of disconnection that you could use for that. In a racemic synthesis, however, just focusing in on the functional groups, I've got an alcohol and a Z-alkene, a good way of making a Z-alkene would be to do a functional group interconversion to the alkyne. That's because a simple Lindlar hydrogenation using a poisoned catalyst can reduce the more electron-rich alkyne down to the alkene, but can't reduce an alkene down to an alkane. 
So we're sort of stopping halfway in a reduction process there. Then it's quite easy to see that we can just do a disconnection here and use the alkyne as a nucleophile into an aldehyde. That's because if we use this propyne, we've got quite an acidic proton on the end. That's pKa like 25-ish. Can be deprotonated quite easily to form the anion, which is a really great nucleophile. Sterically unhindered, these things love attacking carbonyl groups. Now, I think it's fair to argue that both of these are available starting materials. But if you were in the chemistry exam or something, you might be asked to make the aldehyde, I guess. We can do a similar trick to before in identifying that it's got a 1, 2 functionality in it. So therefore, we should be trying to disconnect using an epoxide. First, we're going to need to do a functional group into conversion to the alcohol, which itself could be made by opening an epoxide with a Grignard reagent. Alternatively, you could do a hydroboration of styrene, styrene being a very cheap polymer precursor. The oxidation from an alcohol to the aldehyde could be done in all sorts of ways, like a swern oxidation, using a chromate like PCC or PDC, so Collins type oxidations, or desmartin pyridinane would work too. If you enjoyed the video, please do give it a like and maybe have a look through my retrosynthesis playlist on my channel for more videos in this sort of style.